Genesis chapter 1. Our main verse will be 20. The mother of all living things, speaking of Eve, we will, we will hit chapter 1 and chapter 3. And I hope, again, I don't uh, water down or stretch the truth a little bit here. I want to stay within the context of what is being said and what the word means that I, I define. But before I start, let me share with you some quotes. Abraham Lincoln said this about his mother. I remember my mother's prayers and they have always followed me. They have clung to me all of my life. And so we have a mother here who is a Christian and who prayed to our Lord on behalf of her son, a praying mother. And this son, who became President of the United States, realized that it was his mother's prayers that got him there. And those prayers clung to him. He never forgot them. Something that became a memory to him. Now here are some other godly quotes that I thought were interesting about their mothers and I thought would be helpful. Billy Graham said this, the great evangelist, Only God himself fully appreciates the influence of a Christian mother in the molding of character in her children. I think that's true. I think God knew exactly what he was doing when he created mothers. And God appreciates the fact that mothers take that responsibility very seriously to mold and shape their children. That's why moms go, don't touch that. That's going to burn you. Don't go over there. That's going to hurt you. Don't hang around that guy because he's going to get you into trouble. It's because mothers care. We don't see that as much. We look at it as, oh, why would you hit me for? What did I do wrong? You know, don't tell me not to play with that guy. He's okay. You don't know him. You don't know me. We don't see it, but God does see it, Billy Graham said. George Washington, another president, our first president, says, my mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. All I am, I owe to my mother. I attribute all my success in life to the mortal, intellectual, and physical education I received from her. Again, another president who acknowledges the fact that his mother, not just prayed for her, I'm sure she prayed, but he realized that it was her that gave him success because of her education, her moral values, her intellect, Thinking with the mind and also her physical education. Thinking with the mind. So important for moms to get children to think. You know, there are a lot of smart people out there that are so dumb. I'm not allowed to use the word stupid. My dad used to always tell me, there's no, that word stupid, you don't use because there's no stupid people in the world. They may be naive of things, they may not be educated, but they're not stupid. And so I don't use that word. But they're dumb. (laughs) A lot of educated people are dumb. They have PhDs, they have doctorates, they can study physics, mathematics, and all of these things. But when it comes to the simple word of God, oh no, this can't be true. It's too hard for them to even understand or comprehend. This word is true. This is the Bible. God's instructions for us to live by. There are no errors in here. I've read this thing... At least 18, 19 times I have never found an error in it. And people who say that there are errors in it, I always ask them, show me. Oh, uh, uh, well, someone told me there was an error. Oh, so you're going to believe someone else. Why don't you read it for yourself instead of believing what someone else is saying? And then they say, well, how can you believe a bunch of guys who got together and read the Bible and, and wrote the Bible? I go, wait a minute. A bunch of guys? The Bible has been written in 6,000 years. How can a bunch of guys get together and write the Bible? Come on, think about what you're saying. What you're really saying is you know there's a God and you don't want to live for Him. That's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. You're not saying that you don't believe that there is. You're not saying that you don't believe this is the Bible, the Word of God. You're saying, I don't want it. Plain and simple. Then be honest with yourself. Hey, I can respect that. I can respect a person being honest. Hey, I don't want it. I shared with my brother one time and I shared that scripture in Matthew 1128, come to me, all you who are, you know, weary and heavy laden. You know, I have rest. And he, he just basically told me, he goes, wow, that sounds so enticing. 
I really would love to find rest and peace in my life. And I was getting excited. And I said, well, then what's stopping you? He goes, I don't want it right now. I got too many things I want to do. <laughs> hey, at least he was honest with me, you know, instead of lying. Well, it's a book that's written by a bunch of guys. No, you don't know. See, intellect is so important. We need to think for ourselves. We need to use logic, not the world's logic. The logic that God has given us. You're smart enough to know whether this is true or not. And then you make that choice whether you want to live that way or not. George Washington saw that in his mother. It was Billy Sunday, another great evangelist who was a part of a great revival. said, there is more power in a mother's hand than in a king's scepter. Think about that one for a second. Because mom, they know how to discipline. And they do it in such a beautiful way. That you know you got in trouble, but yet she loves you so much as she's spanking that seat of understanding, you know. Um, Just something about a mom that knows how to do that discipline, and you go off knowing, my mom loves me. She cares about me. What would you write? What would you write in that card to your mom? What would you say about your mom? How has she impacted you in your life? Well, we're going to see how Eve was given such a special gift, and that's the theme of today's message is mothers are a gift of God because Eve was a gift of God to humanity. She was a great example of what a mother was, and we'll see that in Genesis chapter 1. Let me just give you a little bit of the context. In in the first five chapters of Genesis, we have chapter 1 to chapter 2, we have the creation of all things, God creating the heavens and the earths, God creating all of the animals, all of the waters, all of the uh, vegetation, and then God creating man. So we have creation in the first chapter, not evolution, but creation. And creation that was written down for us to simply view and read and believe, like chapter 1 verse 1 just says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's, what do you mean by that? What did I just read? Because people are like, well, what do you mean by that? God created the heavens and the earth. What do you think I mean by that? Well, are you mean spiritually or physically or, or metaphorically? What do you, it's literal. God created the heavens and the earth. Simple. Simple. You have evolution who Darwin comes along and says, look, given enough time, you will see that we've all evolved. Well, it's been hundreds of years, and we haven't seen anything. If anything, we've seen how we devolve, you know, how we're getting worse. You know, there's no evidence, but what Darwin said, and everyone jumped on the bandwagon. One guy, one man, who didn't even have an education, who was dumb, who who pretty much wasted his whole life, who just sat there and thought all day, and the Satan put this thought in his mind, and everyone believes it, and now it becomes a fact when in fact it's a theory and not a fact because when you go to school they tell you this is a theory and theory is not fact scientifically proven and yet when we read this in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth we're like what does that mean it means God did it and so the first two verse first two chapters in in Genesis about God's creating all things and then chapters three through five we see Man coming into the scene and destroying all things. Sin enters into the world. They disobey God immediately. They went to the tree that God says, just don't eat of that tree. Everything else you can have of all the world, just don't eat of that tree. Where do we go? To the tree. And we ate of it. And sin came into the world. And we've been struggling ever since. So that's the context of this being written. So let's go ahead and look at my first point. Mothers are nurturing Mothers are nurturing. Chapter 1, look at verse 26. Then God said, again, chapter 1 is a creation, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And that's even little creepy babies walking around. Over everything, God said, look, let us, isn't that interesting? It says, let us. Are there more gods than one? No. It's only one God. The Bible tells us in Isaiah that there are only one God and there are no other gods, nor will there ever be any other gods. And then what is he talking about? The Trinity. We all understood this. If you were Catholic, you understood this. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Very basic, very simple. They got together and said, let's make man in our image. 
In what image? To look like God? No, not his image, but his image in that free will, choice, dominion, exercising certain attributes of God, like love, like caring, like being gentle, like being concerned, like creating things from other things. These are all attributes of God. Now, there are uncommunicable attributes, those things that we can't do like miracles or create something out of nothing. We can't do that, but we can create from something because we are in the likeness of God. Now, the ability to affect one's environment is God-given because that's what God is basically saying here. I've created you too to affect your environment. Go out and have dominion, or in other words, the Hebrew word is subjugate. Put them under your authority as man. And to this day, man is in authority. Am I right? Is there anyone higher than man that's in authority? Unless you're a UFO freak and you think there's aliens out there, which really haven't shown up yet, but uh, signs that may be demonic, but pretty much man is in dominion, just like God said they would be. And so we're to have dominion over all things. Women are to have dominion. They affect their environment. Mothers have a gift to nurture those around them. It's a gift of God. So that she can affect her environment. Not just her house environment, but her community. And not just her community, but even her, her city, her state, or United States in the case of Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Their mothers affected the world because of her nurturing spirits. So Eve had this gift from God to nurture, and I really believe that all mothers have that gift. The word nurture defines it, defined is to support, encourage, and develop. But it's more than that. I think we have to look beyond that. Because I can support, I can encourage, and I can develop, but I'm not a nurturer. That's hard for men to do. But for women, it's easy for them to be nurturing. Because you see, nurturing is different than just leading or supporting or even building up relationships. It's far more personal than that. And I think that it starts in the womb when that mom has conceived a child. And that connection that they have together, that divine spiritual connection that makes them one. And they spend the next nine months knowing who one another are. Isn't it interesting that, that before the pregnancy strips, you know, the, the red or green or whatever colors that they use, that moms just knew? I'm pregnant. How do they know that? They just knew. They, they knew by certain criterias, but they knew that something's in me. I just know it. Because God makes that connection. Because of that nurturing spirit that they have. Because of God's grace and mercy in using the mothers to affect the world. So it's far more than personal. Uh, far more than just you know precious. You, you see a mother and a child and you go, how precious. But there's a connection there. I, I can't explain it. I don't think any of us can. It is spiritual and it's one that's God's given. But the potential is far more effective than just basically training or leading. Far more effective. All of us here in this room have been affected by our nurturing mothers, one way or another. Some of her attributes and characteristics and values have been pushed onto us because of the relationship that we have with them. Great nurturing has the great power to change people, doesn't it? We saw it in Abraham Lincoln and Washington Billy Sunday that the nurturing power of a woman can change a child, can change a man. <clears throat> My mother had that nurturing gift. She developed certain characteristics in myself. She didn't go out to do it. She wasn't an educated woman. She dropped out of school in like the fourth or fifth grade, but she was very loving and nurturing. She didn't have a list and said, okay, I want my children to be this, I want my children to do that, I want my children to grow up and you know, have this as a life. But what she did was her best as she was raising us. She saw that I was a shy person, so she made sure that I wasn't embarrassed a lot. She protected me from that. She saw that, that uh, because of her 
attribute of caring for people and loving people that rubbed off on me, and she nurtured that through her example. If you give a gift to the mailman, you care about other people. <laughs> You're a caring person because who gives gifts to the mailman? You know? And if you raise your hand, God bless you. you know? Good for you because that's rare. That's rare to see. And my mom was that way. If she saw someone without shoes, she'd give them shoes. If someone asked her for something, she'd give it to them. She'd always sacrifice herself for others. And that rubbed off on me. And I can look back now and I can see why I have this compassion and love for people. I know it's not me and I know I can be very selfish and self-centered at times, but God takes what He has taught me and He gives me the power and strength to fulfill His calling, my calling uh, in my life. And so she was very caring, very, very nurturing, and it created uh, in us uh, the characteristics that we needed to be the people that we are. And it's kind of interesting because here I am, a pastor of a church. You know, I'm supposed to care for people. I'm supposed to love people and help people and be there for people, and that's my calling. And then my sister is actually a, uh, uh, what is it? Not a psychiatrist, but a therapist, which works for a company, but again, helping people, caring for people, getting them through their problems and so forth. And it's interesting that a lot of us are in the, in the service of others, you know, because of our mother. It was Bliss Carmen, a Canadian poet who lived in 1861, said this, Love those around you a little bit extra today and always. Let them love you back a little bit extra, even as you grow. Ask for what you need and give what you most want. I love that last part. Give what you most want. Those are moms. They're always giving more than what they take because they have that nurturing spirit. So mothers are nurturers. And I know moms, you know what I mean and you probably don't even notice it because it's so natural and it just happens through love. And God sees it all more than anyone else. I know with the guys, it just goes over our head. You know, we're more like, why are you babying him? Leave him alone. Let him grow up. He'll be a man, you know? And they're cuddling and loving. Last night, we went to my son's house. He wasn't feeling good. 35-year-old, laying in bed. We walk into his room, and I've got my oil with me, and I'm going to pray and ask God to heal him and, you know, fall upon him and give him strength. And that's what I'm going to do, you know, A, B, C, D. I had my plan out. My wife walks in there, runs right over to him, starts touching his chest, touching his arms, caressing his arms, saying, where does it hurt? Let me see, rubbing his neck, you know. And here's a 35-year-old man being touched by his mom all over his body there, you know, and she's comforting him. And I'm like, okay, I didn't even think of that, you know. <laughs> I didn't even think about going over there and touching it. It was almost like I had this wall, okay, you stay there, I'm over here, we're okay, <laughs> you know, type of thing. You know, it's hard for men to understand that because mom are nurturers. Please, mom, understand, guys don't get it. Just understand that. They, they don't, they're not going to get it completely. You may see signs of it once in a while. And we are compassionate once in a while. We do have feelings and, and so forth. And we do love our children, but we express it differently. It doesn't mean that we don't love them. But please understand, we're just different than moms. So it's a God-given gift to nurture. Moms are homemakers also. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them what? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, have godly children. Have children and have lots of children. In fact, it's a command to populate the world. Don't just stop with one or two or three or ten or twenty. Seventeen. I know, I know family members who had seventeen kids. How many of you know uh, families with seventeen kids come from the mom and dad? Let's see, there's one. How about fifteen? Anybody with 15, 14, 13, 13, 15, 12, 12, wow, 10, wow, 9, wow, okay, How, 5, I stopped at 4, I stopped, all you know me, so you know, raise your hands everyone, you know somebody with 4, 
because it's me. I stopped at four. God commanded them to have children, to have godly children, to help you subjugate the world. In other words, to spread the gospel, to spread Christianity, to spread godly values. How can you say that? It's not what it says. Yes, it does. You have to remember, Adam and Eve were created, chapter 1 and 2, Chapter 3 and 5, they sinned, they fell. What did God do? He covered them. He told them, there's a plan. I'm going to bring the Messiah in Jesus Christ. And he will take away sins. So they were to populate the earth, spreading that gospel to the world. That's why I can say that. And that's what they were supposed to do. Saving souls along the way that were strained because they didn't want to believe or they wanted to live their own life without God. And we've strayed a long way ever since. And so, God commanded them to do so. Well, how do you do that? Well, there's a process of raising children. And it's called being a homemaker. A good mother is, has great involvement in the process of raising her children. A great involvement. Probably a majority of the involvement is from the mother. Listen to Proverbs 31.27. She looks well to the ways of her household. A mother looks to her household. Her heart and her passion is in her household, in her husband and in her children and in their environment. That's where her heart is. Paul said in Timothy 3.12, let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own household well. So wives are to manage their households. They are to watch their households well. You know what manage means, right? They're to take care of everything. It is amazing. They're, they're, they're to wake up early to get breakfast going so that the husband can get up and wash his face, brush his teeth, comb his hair, and good morning, honey, eat, and then he's off with his lunch. And then she wakes up the kids and reminds them to brush your teeth, comb your hair, make your bed, pick up your clothes, and get your homework and get your backpack and get all your food and here's some money and get out the door and go. Or get them in the car and take them. And then once they're gone, then it's like picking up the husband's clothes because she's told him a hundred times to pick up his pants after he puts them on the floor and put them in the hamper, but he never does it because he doesn't know how to. And so he doesn't and she picks up after him. You know? And then... The toothbrush and the toothpaste is squished like this and not rolled up like this. And, you know, all of those things that she's working on. And then she's got to iron and she's got to wash, iron, and then fold and put away. I try to help with the folding. I'm learning. Socks are so easy. You grab them and you go like this and into the drawer and they're done. I love that. Shirts, you have to actually lay them out on, on the bed. I've learned this. Lay them on the bed. You grab the one corner and the other corner. You flip it over with a little sleeve down. Now you've got a nice line. Lay it down. The other side, flip over, and you have it store style with the little you know, collar in the front. So she's teaching me all these things. But that's what a mom does in managing her house. So paying the bills, going grocery shopping, putting gas in the car, getting involved in school, buying ASB cards, getting involved in soccer, baseball, clothes drives, yard sales. Oh, and then there's church, and there's ministry, and then there's helps, and then there's all these things, and moms are managing it all themselves. How do they do that? I'm going crazy thinking about it. You know, it is amazing what they can do. And then on top of that, today, moms are working. Moms are working. Now, that is hard to juggle because something always lacks. Either your job will lack or your household will lack, but something will lack. I know that to be true because when my wife went to work for a couple of years, my children were older, and it was my household was lacking without her there. And the boys had to pick up the slack where it was lacking. So I know that happens. It's hard to juggle those jobs. They need to manage their households well. Also, Paul said in Titus 2.3, the older women likewise, that they be uh, reverent in behavior, not slanderous, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children. I keep doing that. Um, to be discreet, chaste. Then it says homemakers. There's that word homemakers. And the word homemakers in the Greek means works at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands that the word of God may not be blasphemy. Now I know, I know ladies, I'm sorry. I sound like a male chauvinist right now, you know, mentioning these things, but I'm not the one that has mentioned it. The scriptures did. 
It's what the Bible teaches. That women have been created to be good homemakers, good managers of their households. And they are wonderful. I know that by experience. She is devoted to her home duties, um, preoccupied with her domestic affairs. She is a homemaker by nature. There are a few sometimes that somehow pass through the gates of heaven that aren't homemakers, you know, in a sense, or can't raise children. I understand that, generally speaking, but the scriptures tell us that women are homemakers, and they are good homemakers. My mother stayed home. My father worked grave shift, and my mother stayed home, and we could depend on my mom being home. If we were in school, we knew she was home, and she was taking care of all those things. She was cleaning the house, and she was cutting the grass, and, and she was pulling weeds out of the planters and cleaning the garage. Because my dad worked from uh, 11 o'clock till 11 o'clock at night. And so he never did anything around the house because he was working during that time. At night, you can't do much. And when he did get home, he was sleeping until 11, and then he went off to work. And so we learned to do a lot of these things from my mother. But we could depend upon her. She was always there. My mother didn't drive either. She couldn't drive. She did not have the gift to drive. As a teenager, I tried to teach. I'll teach you to drive, Mom. You know, you've taught me a lot. I'll teach you to drive. So we went to Puente Hills Mall, went into the parking lot area. I mean, how can you mess up there? I mean, just a whole empty parking lot on Sunday morning. Okay, now grab the steering wheel and just keep it straight. And we're like going like this. I go, Mom, turn it the other way. Okay. And then we're going this way. No, Mom, the other, why can't you keep it straight? I am. So, okay, let's stop. Stop the car. Okay, keep it. Just keep your hands straight like this. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, Mom. she couldn't do it. She just couldn't do it. It was hilarious. No matter what I did or tried, I tied her hands to the steering wheel. And No, I'm kidding. <laughs> she just couldn't do it. So you know what she did do? She took the bus. She walked. She did whatever she needed to do to get the things done around the household, to pay the bills, you know, to get us to school. And if there was a meeting, she took the bus or she walked for a couple of miles. Work, she took the bus from Rolling Heights all the way to uh, El Monte to go to work. You know, every day, every day and evening. And then come home and cook meals and things like that for us. Of course, this was when we were adults and out of the house that she started to work, had to work. And so she was a great example of that. Uh, another great example is my wife, Virginia. I hit the jackpot with her because she is definitely a nurturing mother. She loves her children and grandchildren. She loves them to death, and they know that. The, the video was a, a little funny uh, it was I was watching it again for the second time, uh, just the fact on how mothers view their children that 's how Virginia views her children it 's like they have no flaws or or anything like that. you know the perspective that she has, and yet at the same time, the children look at the mom and like you 're weird you know <laughs> where do you come from you know it doesn 't make any sense, and they look at Virginia that way sometimes you know it 's like, okay, mom, you told that story a hundred times you know and, and so she 's just a nurturing mother. And then she's a homemaker. She stayed home pretty much uh, most of the time with the children, at least in their younger years. Once they were in high school, she worked for a Christian school nurturing um, the kindergartens there and so forth <clears throat> because they were older and they were able to help in the household. But for most part, she managed everything. She manages everything. She, she's able to do everything from the sports, you know, to the household, to the bills, to the, to the lawn. I mean, I, I can't do a whole lot because of my injury. Uh, we put up canopies to get it ready for the baptism. And uh, she said, let's stake them down because if it blows, the wind's going to take them. Oh, we'll get it this weekend. I can't do it right now. So I look out the window. What's she doing? She's got a sledgehammer. She's got the stakes and she's pounding away. And she's staking down those canopies. I mean, she does everything. And now her latest venture is animals. So she's learning how to manage animals from goats and pigs and guineas and birds and pigs. Did I say pigs? And dogs. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. But she has those gifts. And all of those qualities that I see in her, I see in my boys. Yeah. I see in my boys. Because it rubs off. 
you change the environment around you as mothers, especially Christian mothers. If you're going for a job, what would be the qualifications of a mother? Let me read to you a job description first. This is a job description for mothers. It's a long-term, team players, challenging, permanent work, often chaotic environment. Candidates must process excellent communication, organization skills, be willing to work variable hours, which will include evenings, weekends, and frequently 24-hour shifts on call. Some overnight travel required, including trips, primitive camping sites on rainy weekends, and endless sport tournaments in faraway cities. Travel expenses, not reimbursed. Extensive courier duties, also required. Doesn't that describe a mother? How about the responsibilities of mothers? Listen to this. The rest of your life, that's your responsibility. Even when they're older, it's still your responsibility. Must be willing to be hated, well, at least temporarily until they need $5. Must be willing to, to bite your tongue repeatedly. Also must, have the, uh, must possess the physical stamina of a pack mule and be able to go from zero to 60 miles in three seconds flat in case this time the screaming comes from the backyard or someone's crying woof. Must be willing to face stimulating technical challenges such as small gadget repair, mysterious sludge in the toilet, I remember one, one year it was like the toilet just wouldn't, wouldn't um, flush. And trying to fix it. She tried to fix it over and over. <laughs> Finally she says, you need to fix this because it ain't working. So I took it all apart, found a pair of goggles stuck in the side. <laughs> I guess they were trying to swim in it. I don't know. <laughs> They're hanging on the bottom. You know? <laughs> so you've got to have these skills. A must be able to screen calls, maintain calendars, coordinate production, multiple homework projects. Must have ability to plan, organize social gatherings for clients of all ages and mental outlooks. Must be willing to uh, be indispensable uh, one minute and embarrass the next. Must handle assembly and, and product safety testing of a half a million cheap plastic toys and battery operated devices. Must always hope for the best, but be prepared for the worst. Must assume final. Complete accountability for the quality of the end product. Responsibility also includes floor maintenance, janitorial work throughout the facility. Doesn't that describe a mom? That's a mom. That's amazing. I was studying all this and I was just blown away at some of the research that, that I was finding on moms and the scriptures and, and what they really do. And it's amazing. I don't know how they do it. You know, they will be sick and they will still work. It's amazing. They will be dying and they'll get up and they'll take care of their children. Yeah. You'll ask them to do something and they'll say, I don't want to, but then you find them doing it. Yeah. They just do because they're so gifted in that way. But also moms are moms of faith. Look at chapter 3, verse 17 through 20. And we'll close up with this. This was after the fall. <clears throat> Adam fell, sin came into the world, and God had to curse them because of that fall. And so God said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, and shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herbs of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the dust. In other words, you'll be working for the rest of your life because of sin. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are and dust you shall return. And then in verse 20, he says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve. He looked over at his wife. Up to this point, she didn't have a name. It was the woman it was the female, you know, but she didn't have a name. And then Aunt Adam names her, and he names her Eve. Eve means the mother of all living things. I thought that was interesting, that Adam named his wife. Now here's a male chauvinist thought, that you're going to take it that way, but women are product of their husbands. 
they're to reflect their husbands. I know that doesn't sound enticing to women, but that's what the scripture is saying here. Their value and their worth are in their husbands and who their husbands are as men, godly men, men that love the Lord. And so when you are looking for a husband, find a husband that loves the Lord and you can't do wrong. You will be blessed because of that. He names her Eve, the mother of all living things. Now, wait a minute. Have any children been born yet? No, not yet. So how can she be the mother of all living things when there's no children that were born yet? What is he saying? He's talking about the future, right? Again, understand. They sin. What do they do? They try to cover themselves, you know? And God says, that's not going to (laughs) do. First, you don't know how to sew. That looks silly. You know, secondly, it's not enough. And it's done by your own hands. And so I will offer up a sacrifice and I will give you a covering. And he does that for them. He says, and I have a plan. Through the woman's seed will come the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he will die on a cross for the sins of the world so that they could have everlasting life. That is my plan. They believed it. They believed what God said. They believed it by faith that God would give them an offspring that would be the Messiah. They had faith in God. They had faith in His Word and what He had said. That's faith. That's blind faith. It's faith that doesn't understand. It's faith that doesn't know. But faith that believed what God said. It's amazing how children have faith. How children can be great examples of faith. I was watching my two granddaughters this weekend... And they're eight and seven and eight, nine and eight, something. Yeah, I got too many of them. Nine and eight, Abigail and uh, Taylor Ann. I call her TA. <clears throat> they're playing outside and they're running around, and I'm just watching them. They're running, you know, and they're laughing and they're screaming and they're jumping, and I just see them having fun. Then we get in the pool and they're swimming in the pool, jumping off. Watch me, watch me, Dad. Watch me, Dad. Watch me. You know, watch me do this, watch me do that. And they're playing and not thinking about anything, just having fun. They're in the house and they're playing with some game and having fun. They're sitting down watching a a cartoon and they're having fun. And I thought about it as I was studying this, and I'm thinking, how come they never asked me or even dad, hey, did you pay the light bills? They never asked that question. Hey, do we got food in the refrigerator? Did you go out shopping? They never asked that question. Are we going to be around next week? Never asked that question. See, they just, by faith, believed that all that was going to be okay. And that's an example of great faith. Children have great faith. They don't worry. They don't care about tomorrow. They don't worry about next week. All they're worrying about is the very minute that they're living. That's how we should be. We should look at our children and look at them and say, that's how we ought to have faith. We shouldn't be worrying about our bills. We shouldn't be worrying about our jobs. We shouldn't be worrying about those things around us in the world. And so We should just be enjoying what God has given us today. I'm not saying don't work. Enjoy your work. Love your work. It provides for us. Do it by faith. See, she was a woman of faith. She believed what God said, and she believed that she would have a successful child. And moms see that in their children. They see things in their children that the children don't even see. Because they live by faith. They can look at a child and tell the child, one day son, one day daughter, you're going to be the president of the United States. They're like, well, I don't want to be the president of the United States. Yeah, but you could be. I don't want to be. Okay, a policeman, a fireman, you know, a veterinarian. Why do you want to be a veterinarian? now? forget that. (laughs) I mean, they just see things in children that children don't even see in themselves. They see the best in their children. They see the future of their children. How many times have you looked at your children and said, I wonder what kind of babies they're going to give me? I've done that. And they've given me beautiful babies. Because they see not just the present, but they see the future. They're women of faith. They, They are women that nurture their children. They are women that maintain their household. And they are women that trust in Christ by faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. And thus they are what we call Christians. Godly women who love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of their heart mind, soul, and strength. And they're amazing. They're amazing. And so when, when I believe, uh, was it Billy Graham who said that, that God appreciates them more than anyone else, I believe that because we forget about them. I read a post today 
And the post said, eggs are done, drinks are ready, salad's tossed. Wait a minute, what's today? And it was a woman who wrote it. Oh yeah, it's Mother's Day. She's doing it all. I'm going to a barbecue today and my mom's cooking. That's what moms do. That's what they do. You know, they are always in the mode of serving. You know? And God sees it above anyone else and appreciates it more than us because God knows that we most of the time overlook it. Don't mention it. Don't appreciate it. But God is good to us by giving us some others. Let me close. <clears throat> Again, if you're a nurturing mother, God bless you. I really believe you are. And I really believe that if you take that and you mix it in with the scriptures as you're studying and, and, and learning about God and mixing it together, you're going to see some beautiful children. You're going to see some beautiful grandchildren uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. And as you're managing your homes and maintaining your households, you know, do it by faith in God. That God is our rewarder. Nobody else. Because see, moms are great at not needing appreciation from us. Not needing the acclimates. Not needing the pats on the backs. They do it because they love us completely. Oh, I know. I know. Once in a while it's good to hear it from our children. Once in a while it's good to hear it, you know, just once in a while. Well, I told you I loved you when I was five years old, as he said. You know, that should be good enough. No, once in a while it's good to, good to hear that from you, you know, to appreciate your mom. And that's why Mother's Day started in the early 1900s. You know, not to commercialize it or anything. The person, Anne, who started Mother's Day, Jarvis, I believe it was, she didn't want to commercialize it. In fact, she was against it after it became commercialized. She just wanted children to love their mothers, simply. And we need to do that simply because they're wonderful gifts from God.